Next three are Sandy Polshak, Ron Buell, and Harriet Cook. And they'll be followed by David Delk, James Olfink, and Josh Burkhart, 16, 17, and 18. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Mayor Wheeler and commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Sandy Polishuk. I'm speaking, I'm with 350 PDX. Mayor, we Mayor Wheeler, three weeks ago at the town hall on climate priorities, I was delighted to hear you so strongly commit to 100% renewables and to declare climate change our most pres pressing issue globally and that Portland will be the line of offense in these times when acting locally is more important than ever. Obviously, continuing to prohibit investments in the carbon underground 200 companies remains an, an, another important piece of our local climate strategy. We were glad to find the proposed policy does so. Commissioner Udaly, I was equally delighted when you spoke at the fo uh, same forum of a feasibility study on a municipal bank, acknowledging that Wells Fargo is bad and all the available large banks are just as bad. We understand it will take time to disengage from Wells Fargo, but we can place them on the list to make clear our intention and that we are consciously moving in that direction. I urge you to do so. Caterpillar is another company we must have on that list. In addition to not meeting our SRI guidelines, they're helping build the Dakota Access Pipeline. To be consistent with your resolution opposing uh, the pipeline and supporting the Standing Rock Sioux in their struggle, we need to cease further investments in Caterpillar. Anything less would demonstrate that your resolution um, was not a genuine commitment. In addition to adding these companies, uh, I strongly urge you to keep the committee active. These citizen volunteers work diligently for a year doing a thorough and excellent job. Their dedication and hard work needs to be honored, but even more importantly, the city needs the committee's oversight to ensure their investments are aligned with our values. And I know my time is up, but if you would permit me, I, I do have the answer to your questions on the Carbon under, uh, Underground 200. Um, I'd appreciate that. Yeah. Um, it, it, I wouldn't call it a subscription. I would call it a registration. And that as long as you are not asking for, to register for commercial purposes, it's free and it's almost instant. Um, my um, compatriot sitting next to me um, signed up on her tablet um, during this meeting uh, and will get full access. So you can all personally do that. Thank you. So Sandy. thank the, you. Um, am I correct in deducing that the purpose of that list is to list out fossil fuel companies? It, what it lists are the 100 coal companies and 100 gas and oil companies with the largest oil, um, reserves in the ground. It's part of the acknowledgement that we need to keep those reserves in the ground. And so is that what the language in the uh, proposed resolution is, a great, is acceptable to 350PDX? Uh, that portion of it, Thank you. I think the resolution needs to go farther. <laughs> yes, but in terms of the fossil fuels, yes. I just wanted to check. Thank you. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you, Sandy. Good afternoon. Hi, I'm Ron Buell from, from Portland, and uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline aside, Wells Fargo is still the city of Portland's bank, holding uh, 35 million of the city's 40 million in current deposits, not to mention its profits from underwriting on matters uh, like our recent housing bonds. Wells Fargo Bank, over recent years, created as many as 2 million unauthorized fake credit cards and fake checking accounts. This came about because the bank tied compensation to how many accounts employees could open. This fraud took down the bank's CEO. He was fired. But on the way out the door, Fortune reports, he has been given a golden parachute immediately worth $133 million to him in his retirement. And this was uh, despite a, a $41 million clawback. 
So uh, Wells Fargo CEO Stump first fired 5,300 mostly low-level employees before he himself was fired. Quote, everybody knew there was fraud going on and the people trying to end it were the ones who got in trouble, says one manager who was fired. Maybe some of you saw the movie The Big Short. In a recent speech, New York Reserve Bank President Bill Dudley compared Wells Fargo's uh, recent problems of fraud to the 2007 mortgage crisis, which was also fanned by flawed incentive systems at Wells Fargo. These incentives encourage brokers to turn out as many loans as possible, even if the borrowers couldn't pay them back. Wells Fargo lobbying efforts led to deregulation, and in some policies on mortgage-backed securities, subprime loans, and credit default swaps helped lead to the crash. After the 2007 meltdown, housing prices fell by a third. Families lost $7 trillion in home equity in the U.S. More than 5 million homeowners lost their homes. So Portland uh, Forward is joining today with the Alliance for Democracy to ask the city to do a feasibility study on the creation of a public bank. Join Seattle, Oakland, Philadelphia, and Santa Fe in looking carefully at the uh, public bank feasibility and the success of the North Dakota State Bank. You're going to hear some more testimony on this today because when you're discussing a no-buy list and city investment policies, it's directly relevant uh, to our need for a public bank. Thank, thank you. you, sir. Good afternoon. Hi. I, I want to thank you all for caring. That's something that's so clear being a Portlander in, in how you function. My name is Harriet Cook. Most of what I'm going to say has already been said. I'm a member of the Portland Public Banking Alliance. And I'm testifying first in support of keeping the Socially Responsible Investment Committee alive as an independent and essential research panel to assist the city in making sound ethical decisions about how to best invest public dollars. Second, I'm here to ask for the feasibility study for a Portland public bank. In addition to concerns about fraud and ethics that we've heard about, there are also significant risk to public dollars in banking with these institutions. Under the Bankruptcy Reform Act of 2005 and the Dodd-Frank Act of 2013, derivative holders in banks are given first priority to a failing bank's assets over depositors that includes government revenues and pension funds. We need some place else that's safe, that doesn't do derivatives to put our money. A Portland public bank could be modeled after the Bank of North Dakota, which was established almost 100 years ago. Benefiting from its bank, North Dakota was the only state in, the, in a continuous budget surplus since the banking crisis of 2008, generating a whopping 25% return on equity even in 2008. In 2009, it was in the unique position of reducing individual income and property taxes by a combined $400 million. In 2011, they were reduced by $500 million. Every year from the banking crisis through at least 2012, the Bank of North Dakota reported a return on investment of between 17 and 26 percent. Portland does have options to investing in Wall Street banks, and I encourage the city to complete a feasibility study to establish a Portland public bank that can support our values and the sustainable vision of our city. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and just by way of an interesting footnote, um, I have spent a lot of time on the phone with the folks in North Dakota about their banking model, and Thank certainly you. a number of you in this room and had had many conversations with me uh, over the years down in Salem. Um, th this is where these two issues intersect, interestingly. Um, check out North Dakota's investments and where they're making those returns. You will not be happy. I, I understand their connection with the, um, with the oil, the fossil fuel industry, and, and, and I hear you. And um, that said, in Ellen Brown's book, which is about all I have to go off of, she compares North Dakota to California, which has even greater oil reserves. And there, investments and their state funds went down during this time. So yes, 
we can model after, but we in no way want to be like the Bank of North Dakota. We have different values, and we need a bank that supports those values and those businesses. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank I'd, you. I'd like to add that uh, my office has begun working on a resolution to conduct a feasibility study uh, for a municipal bank. It's going to take us about a month to uh, craft it. It's it's more complicated than you might imagine, and it is just a feasibility study, but it's the first first necessary step. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Next three, please. Are David Delk, James Olfink, and Josh Burkhart, and they'll be followed by Hung Nam, Christopher Cutruff, and Ginny Virginia Feldman. That's 19, 20, and 21. Good afternoon. You know, my name is uh, David Delk. I'm president of the Alliance for Democracy. I really appreciate the fact that you're holding this hearing and considering how we invest our money. It's a really important topic. I want to be really clear that I totally support including Wells Fargo and Caterpillar on the do not buy list and support the maintenance of that list uh, as it exists now. I am totally opposed to the city treasurer's proposal uh, for how we should move forward. It fails to take into account the criteria used by the Socially Responsible Investment Committee in making its res, uh, recommendations. One concern uh, that is always uh, asked is if we're not going to invest uh, and put our money with Wells Fargo, what are we going to do with it? Uh, so uh, the answer, at least in one state, uh, North Dakota, was to do a public bank. And so we've already discussed some of this. Uh, so. Uh, um, I, I, I will note uh, that the bank uh, helped the state escape the 2007-8 uh, credit crisis uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, befell most of the rest of the nation. During the past 20 years, it's added nearly $400 million to the state's general fund, provides student loans uh, at less than 2.5%, refinances student, student debt saving students millions of dollars. It works in cooperation with local community banks and credit unions to fund business development and provide mortgages. Uh, because of those relationships, uh, partnerships, the Bank of North Dakota expands the lending capacity of those local financial institutions. So I have a nice little story here, I won't go into it, about how it really helped during the uh, great flood of uh, 1997 in Grand Forks and a nice illustration of how it worked in North Dakota versus how it worked in Minnesota. So I also want to call for a feasibility study for creating a municipal bank in the city of Portland. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having this hearing and for revisiting this important topic, and most importantly, considering the input of the public in this decision making, which I think uh, is something that is and should be valued and continue to be valued in Portland, which is why I think that Commissioner Udaly's uh, comments about uh, continuing to involve the public in our uh, investments are, is so key and having transparency throughout. Um, so I'm James Offsink, and I do encourage the council to add Wells Fargo and Caterpillar to the do not buy list and to continue to maintain that list and to uh, solicit public feedback um, in adding or removing uh, corporations from that list. But I also feel like this exercise is a little bit like whack-a-mole. I mean, to your point er earlier, Mayor Wheeler, for every investment that uh, we could be making in a private corporation, there are likely going to be people who are unhappy with it, which is why I think it's so important that we uh, invest in a long-term solution, uh, which is a public bank, where we have complete control and we can invest uh, in accordance with our city's values. So. Uh, I think that we need to decouple what is uh, good for us financially from what maximizes Wall Street profits, which is the investments that we're limited to right now. And if we were instead, um, instead of funding fossil fuel expansion, uh, exploitive human rights abuses, and corporate corruption, we should be using our investments to support local affordable housing, sustainable infrastructure, and quality education. Uh, one of the values, as uh, David uh, touched on, that North Dakotans have found important since the late 1960s is education. 
which is especially significant to me because I spent 10 years working at PSU in the Office of Student Financial Aid, and every day I would help people mortgage their futures with companies like Wells Fargo, who would routinely charge them upwards of 12% interest rate for a private student loan. The Bank of North Dakota offers comparable loans at 2%. Which is not to say that that's what we'd do. Maybe here in Portland, we'd decide to focus on building up our affordable housing stock, reinvesting in our schools, or transitioning to sustainable, sustainable energy, or something else. Um, but the point for me is that we should be investing in line with our values. And the only way to do that long term is to control that uh, through a municipal bank. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for having us here. My name is Joshua Burkhart, and I tend to work with people on goal setting. The goal I assume today is to represent the people of Portland who have continuously voted in favor of public education, environmental conservation, and local community. These are not the goals of Wells Fargo or other large national banks. Corporate banks are only interested in their profit margins, it's how they work, while a Portland public bank would be operated for the interests of public services, has been pointed out um, by my colleagues here. It would be run by professional banks, not politicians, and it would be run for the benefit of the city and community. A municipal bank can decrease costs of working with large banks like Wells Fargo, saving taxpayers considerable sums on critical infrastructure costs like roads, parks, and affordable housing. Earnings from the bank, from loans and interest, could then go back into feeding the city coffers, rather than the profit margins of Wall Street, as we were considering at the beginning of this meeting about our investment potential. Our government revenues are too large to be deposited in local community banks and credit unions. A public bank would not compete with these smaller community banks, but would instead partner with these local institutions on joint loans with city money, creating jobs right here in Portland. When I work with people on their goals, we have to look at where they are applying their energy and how they can invoke their own autonomy. Currently, Portland is allowing its finances to be used for the interests of corporate banks and their profit margins. Meanwhile, in Washington, we have a government which does not share the same values as Portland when it comes to public education, low-income housing, the environment, and so many other parts of life that Portland holds dear. A public bank would increase our own autonomy in the face of this national opposition to our goals while capitalizing on our own finances and putting them to good use for us rather than the use of Wall Street. We would propose that a Portland public bank be aligned with the spirit and ethics of Portland with a board of directors appointed by the city council. We have drafted a resolution proposing an independent $75,000 feasibility study like those already approved in Seattle, Oakland, Santa Fe, and Minneapolis. I hope you will give it your thorough consideration. Thank you for your testimony. Next three, please. Our Hong Nam, Christopher Cutruff, and Ginny Virginia Feldman and they'll be followed by Patricia Kohlberg, Curtis Bell, and Dr. Herman Frankel, 22, 23, and 24. Good afternoon. Hi. I'm Hyung Nam. I'm one of the members of the Portland Socially Responsible Investment Committee that's been in suspension since um, the December resolution. And I just want to say that I'm here to speak um, for the majority of us that are on the committee that I've checked in with. And you're going to hear from another member as well. And we all want to urge you to adopt our report that we um, made last September and continue the SRI process. I want to just, um, other people have already um, talked about some of the points, so I just want to start with just um, thanking both Commissioner Daly and Fritz for those amendments. And I, I think that's one possible option here. Um, if we add also um, not only um, the companies that you already talked about, but Wells Fargo and Amazon as well. But I really think that we can go with the full list that we had, um, the nine companies that we came up with last September. But let me just back up and start with just saying that, you know, um, there's no way to avoid controversy. I mean, if we want to be a fossil fuel city, if we want to be a sanctuary city, that's controversial as well. And I, I would like us to um, stay to, true to those kinds of values by being consistent with our investment policy as well. So um, first of all, I want to point out, I mean, I'm one of the people that have spent hours and hours researching, reading, just stacks in my garage, I have stacks of these MSCI reports. And I did find some publicly available uh, examples of um, MSCI reports that I sent out to all of you. And if you look at the one that I sent um, about Wells Fargo that's publicly available from their website, it shows that the ESG, right, um, has 14 categories. Out of those 14 categories, seven of those categories are given a zero weight. 
It's a dog and pony show. So it has no effect on the ratings. So for example, on um, business ethics and fraud, has zero weight. Wells Fargo got a two out of 10 on business ethics and fraud. Um, they also got a low score on labor management, but because it's given a zero weight, it's, it um, distorts the rating that they get. Um, but I think more importantly than that, um, it, what's really important is naming these companies. In terms of financial impact, we're talking about a very small financial impact, but these companies all invest millions of dollars for their corporate image, PR. And that's what matters. If we quietly just buy or not buy certain securities, no one's going to know that. When we name these companies, um, even, for example, Wells Fargo, none of those securities mature until, um, some don't mature until next year. One matures <laughs> in June. Um, there'll be so little financial impact, but saying that the city of Portland, as a sanctuary city, names companies like Wells Fargo, Caterpillar, Amazon, Nestle. Th thank you, so I'm gonna have to ask you to wrap it up. It's a really important uh, difference. So um, I want to urge you to adopt our resolutions, uh, uh, or adopt our report. We put nine companies on the do not buy list, um, following um, Treasurer Cooperman's plan would not invest in 11 companies. By following our report, you would have more options to invest in companies to get the returns until we find a viable option Thank like you. creating a, a public bank. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Sorry to push you along. I apologize. I hate doing that.